Welcome everyone. This is uh, definitely a different kind of format and uh, sitting here in my uh, suit jacket and slippers and pajamas. So, but uh, anyway, I am talking about uh, annual legal review and what we're talking about isn't necessarily anything formal, um, but just taking a pause every now and then and looking at very various aspects of your business um, from a legal perspective on, on a regular basis. And so I um, wanted to introduce you to the team. Um, you know, no production can come off, um, you know, by one person. So this is the rest of my production team. You probably will, will hear from them at some point. And so I, I just wanted to go ahead and make introductions, let you know they're around. Um, they uh, might come in and out, uh, say a few words, and uh, uh, anyway, it can be a little bit distracting. So, but it, this is Jack and Sophie, and then Rocky is is our our little cat. So, if you hear any animals, then uh, that's this is my production team. So, I you know I really enjoy um, presenting at E for E because I you know you guys are such a great audience. There's always a lot of uh, interaction and um, um, I don't know just audience feedback and I and I really like that so uh, and I, I do hope that uh, you'll send uh, Will some some questions uh, and he'll chime in and, and interrupt me if you do have any comments during the presentation but but feel free um, but I, I knew this would be a different format and that the the um, you know feedback for me would be a little bit different so I, I thought I'd give things a try. So every now and then I, I like to try to be funny. Um, every now and then some, you know, a few folks laugh when I'm talking. So I just wanted to see that what that would be like. So I, I prepared a joke for you. And uh, so I just want to, you know, feel the, the wave of, of the reaction from you. So why did the bicycle fall over? Because it was too tired. And I, I, you know, I, I wasn't sure how you were going to react, so I, I put together some canned laughter for you. So here's, uh, here, here's you guys laughing in the, in the Zoom meeting. Also, um, I, I know that um, if I have 5% of you actually, you know, listening with both ears and watching, uh, that would be pretty amazing. So, so I did provide a, a link uh, to the presentation, um, you know, not being all that smart. I embedded it in the slide. So if you click on the slide, um, it'll take you right to my presentation. Um, that's a little circular, so you know you don't have it. So here's the link, and I also put it in the chat, so you should be able to um, to grab it from the chat, so that you don't have to type this this long thing. I um, in in the um, in my slides, I um, I've got links to a few different uh, places on the internet. I thought thought I'd give you a few resources um, in my talk and I figured you could peruse those while you're listening to me with uh, with one of your ears so if you go to the if you go to the um, uh, the presentation and you see a picture of an article you should be able to, to um, just um, tap on the link or tap on the picture and it should uh, open a link to that that article so um, hopefully uh, that works through SlideShare. I didn't test it, so I may be, be wrong, but uh, anyway, feel free. And uh, after, you know, obviously we can make the, the slides available to you if you'd like, and, and you can have access to those. So uh, annual legal review, what sorts of things should you look at? Um, you know, I think it's a good idea on a regular basis, look at your business, its operations, uh, various aspects of it and sit back and uh, think about uh, is, you know, are there some improvements that can be made? Are there some things that, that should be different? And uh, so the first thing, you know, those of you who know me well, uh, know that contracts are always near and dear to my heart. And so the first thing I want to talk about are your company's contracts and making sure that you've got them in order. So now, not every uh, small business thinks a lot about contracts. Um, you know, I've got clients from, you know, solopreneurs to, you know, fairly decent sized businesses that have a lot of uh, employees and some sophistication in their contracting processes. Um, but I do think that most 
uh, companies should think about some contract documents. And I wrote a, an article, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago um, about these contracts and basically the, um, you know, four form contracts that, uh, that's Sophie, by the way, if you can hear, um, I think it's feeding time. So <laughs> you'll hear a lot of her if that's true. But uh, anyway, I, most, most businesses, even if they're very small, should have uh, a few contracts. So, so I wrote a, a, a blog post about that. If you click on this, it'll take you to the, that blog post. So what are those four contracts? One are customer contracts. Uh, most of us uh, have regular engagements with a number of different customers or clients. And it's a good idea to have uh, a form contract that you can use to present uh, to your customers or your clients at the beginning of your engagement to at least outline, um, you know, the terms of your engagement and, uh, you know, some of the important aspects of it, like payment terms and those sorts of things. Um, and one of the most important uh, reasons you should have that is because uh, your contracts can help uh, make sure that you get paid uh, by your, your clients or your, your customers. So, this is a, uh, a screenshot of a blog post that I wrote. And again, you can tap on it to uh, go to the post. Um, but uh, you, some of you might recall uh, back in January of, of 2017, I did this present presentation at E4E at Rock, Rockwood Bank um, called Getting Paid. And uh, I outlined some uh, strategies that businesses can use uh, to help make sure that they get paid. And uh, coincidentally, this was the, um, this is when I first revealed my total lack of artistic ability and, uh, and, and started using, uh, stick figures in my, in my, um, uh, in my presentation. So, but anyway, one of the reasons it's important to have contracts with your, your customers is because you can put some provisions in there that will, uh, put you in a better position to make sure you get paid if, uh, in, you know, if, if they, uh, if, if you have troubles, um, you know, having them pay voluntarily. Another uh, important uh, type of agreement that most businesses should have is a non-disclosure agreement. And um, it's not unusual uh, for us in our, uh, you know, day-to-day -day business interactions to find ourselves in a position where we need to reveal information to somebody um, that's very sensitive. And if, um, you know, if they don't keep it confidential, then, um, you know, it, it could hurt our business. And so um, it's a good idea to have a, a form uh, non-disclosure agreement so that if you find yourself in that situation, you can present that to, um, to the other party and uh, you'll have, uh, you know, contractual uh, protection uh, for your information. And that's especially true if you're uh, disclosing, disclosing information that constitutes a trade secret. And um, you know, every business uh, pretty much has uh, at least some uh, trade secret information. And the way trade uh, secret law works is if um, it, it only retains its legal protection as long as you um, take reasonable uh, precautions to protect the information. And if you uh, disclose trade secret information to people without protecting it with a non-disclosure agreement, that can invalidate that protection. So definitely, if you're gonna um, if you're gonna disclose any information that constitutes a trade secret, you'll definitely want to um, you'll want to have a non-disclosure agreement in place. And um, I did. Uh, I've got another post that that I, I wrote a little while back, uh, just kind of explaining. Uh, non-disclosure agreements, how they work, uh, various aspects of, of the contracts. Um, and I also uh, put in the post a link to a sample non-disclosure agreement. So if you want to see what one look, looks like or if you need one for your own business, you could just uh, go to that post and, and click on the link and download that sample form. Another uh, contract that, that most businesses should have are online terms and conditions. And what we're talking about here are uh, terms and conditions that people um, will click through uh, when they're doing business with you on, on your website. Um, now, this is especially important if you're signing, uh, excuse me, if you're selling 
uh, anything on your website, you want to make sure that uh, you know those transactions are uh, covered by you know contractual terms that uh, protect your interests. And so having uh, online terms and conditions uh, that your customers or your clients have to click that they agree to um, before they buy something for from you uh, can be uh, r really helpful. So, and then the last uh, standard uh, contract that most businesses should have uh, are standard terms and conditions of purchase and standard terms and conditions of sale. And it's r really common uh, for companies to do business with each other. You know, they sell goods, they sell services uh, without signing an actual contract. But they'll, you know, exchange emails, um, they will uh, submit purchase orders, quotes, uh, those sorts of things without ever signing a contract. Um, so if you don't have a signed contract uh, and, you know, there's a dispute that arises under the business arrangement, how do you know what the terms of the agreement are? Um, you know, you might have basic terms like price, um, quantity, those sorts of things uh, actually, you know, outlined in black and white in your emails or your purchase order documents. Um, but, um, you know, other things you tend not to uh, discuss, you know, the small print, um, what we call boilerplate terms, um, like warranties and those sorts of things. Um, if you don't have a signed agreement about those, uh, you know, what, um, what are the terms if there's a dispute? And the, the law has a way of sorting that out, um, but it really puts at a disadvantage uh, a party who didn't have their standard terms that they put into play. And so, for instance, if I uh, was going to uh, buy some widgets uh, from Bill Pernat and I sent him an email and said, uh, you know, I need to buy some widgets at a certain price and I attached my terms and conditions of sale, which or excuse me, purchase, which had, you know, all kinds of provisions in there that, that were good for me. And Bill replied, sure, I'll take care of that. And then he sent me the widgets and I paid for them. And then there was a dispute. We've got a situation where my terms and conditions were in play. Bill's weren't. He's going to be really disadvantaged um, because the, the contract when we go to court and the court sorts it out is going to favor me uh, because Bill didn't have his terms and conditions in play. So um, that uh, particularly if you're, if you're doing uh, business by, uh, you know, uh, entering into your business arrangements by exchanging emails or uh, purchase order documents, you really should have a set of terms that favor you when you're purchasing and then also a set of terms that favor you when you uh, are selling, or excuse me, yeah, selling stuff. So another category of uh, things that you should think about are uh, things that have, have regular deadlines. Um, so one example of those, um, if you have a registered uh, trademark, um, that trademark will only, uh, it'll expire if you don't, um, if, if you don't regularly um, update the, uh, the registration. So, um, so I uh, registered Blue Maven Law when I first uh, put out my own shingle several years ago and you're required to update the registration between the fifth and sixth year after you register your uh, trademark. And so it's been just over five years since my trademark was registered. So this year I'm going through the process of, of updating that. If you don't do that, you lose your trademark protection. And then you also have to uh, uh, update the registration on every 10th anniversary of your mark. So as long as you do that, the protection lasts forever. Um, but if you fail to do that, then you could lose your mark and other people could infringe on it and you wouldn't have any recourse. So it's a good idea to, um, you know, put in your tickler system if you've got uh, a calendar or something that can remind you of things that are going to happen in the distant future. Uh, you know, put a reminder to yourself uh, that, that you need to do that. One thing that I see uh, quite often uh, that's expired uh, when I look at, at businesses um, 
the paperwork um, is uh, their fictitious name registration. So if you're doing business uh, using any name other than your exact legal name, you're required by Missouri law to register that name as a fictitious name or a DBA. And uh, that registration is good for five years and you have to uh, renew it. Um, if you don't, it'll expire and you will be out of compliance. So you can see, this is my um, renewal of my uh, fictitious name registration. And uh, you can see that it expires. Uh, I just renewed it, I, I guess, last month. So it expires in, in, um, uh, in well, five years from now. Um, maybe it was a year ago, wasn't it? 2024, four years from now. Um, so anyway, so it's a good idea to, uh, you know, put a reminder um, that uh, you need to uh, update your fictitious name registration and renew it. Um, if you have other things that, you know, like that, that have regular deadlines, uh, you should also uh, put a, um, a tickler for, for that. Uh, some examples are your lease. If you lease space for your business, um, that lease has a term and it's going to expire at some point. Um, now, lease terms uh, generally either, you know, when it comes to the end of it, they, they'll expire. Sometimes they automatically renew um, for, you know, if it's a five-year lease, it might renew for, for five years. It might renew for one year. Um, you might have options to renew. Um, when you have an option to renew as a tenant, um, there's usually uh, requirements as far as the timing of giving your landlord notice that you want to renew the lease. In other words, the option uh, is, uh, expires and you could lose your, your uh, you know, you could lose your space. So it's a good idea to tickle that. Um, that's the same with, you know, important contracts. Um, you know, it's, it's a good idea to have a system of reminding yourself uh, when they expire, uh, when you need to provide notice, if you want to uh, terminate them and those sorts of things. Ryan, I got and, two, two I'm notes sorry. for you. Um, okay. Bill says like I'll a also, TED talk. Well, go ahead. I, I totally forgot to uh, check the time when I started. So I have no idea how long it's been. So yeah, and I get three, really stupid when I'm talking in public. So three and a half minutes or so you're okay. Um, That's all I have left. Yeah. Well, we okay. got time for Q and A too. Or we can we can mix that in, so we're okay. Okay. Good. Um, Thad wants to know: um, Can a non-disclosure agreement protect subcontractors from contacting the client and discussing rates? Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely they they can. Um, now, in, in that uh, in in that circumstance, you probably will want in your uh, contract with your subcontractor. Uh, terms that prohibit that sort of thing. I would just take it on directly and, and just tell them that they can't circumvent uh, your relationship with with uh, with the customer. Okay, thank you. Okay, so another um, set of um, uh, of things that you need to take care of that are that are really important are corporate formalities, particularly if you're uh, doing business through a corporation, you're required to have an annual meeting of shareholders and an annual meeting of directors every year. Um, it's so common uh, for business owners not to do that. I just see that uh, very, very often. I do, you know, in my practice, I uh, help people buy and sell businesses and one of the things that we always look at in due diligence are the corporate books of the seller. Um, and it's very common that they're non-existent. Um, they might have uh, minutes from the initial meetings when their attorney helped them set up the company and then they completely disregarded that. And one of the reasons that it's important to uh, observe these formalities is it puts you um, at risk of losing your limitation of liability protection that corporations and LLCs provide. So when you do business through uh, an entity like an LLC or a corporation, your, um, your entity um, acts as a shield that shields your personal assets against the liabilities of your business. And if you don't 
um, observe the formalities that are required, then the law might uh, pierce that, that shield or that corporate veil and it leaves your, your assets at risk. Um, just something as simple as just, um, you know, signing uh, annual minutes uh, every year, electing directors and officers. Um, if you don't do that, you could, you could put your uh, personal assets at risk unnecessarily. Okay. All right. Um, I hey, put a few kind of tidbits in a, um, in a category uh, that I am just referring to as increasing your sophistication. And um, as you know, as, as we do business uh, through the years, we really should improve our uh, operations, um, you know, adopt policies, uh, institutionalize our knowledge, you know, quit um, uh, flying by the seat of our pants as much. Um, but as we uh, do business, we should improve. I adopted as my firm's motto um, with my one employee, uh, when I first started, always be improving. And that's what we try to do. Whatever, whatever we do, whether it's contracts that we're working on or processes or whatever, uh, we try to improve those uh, every time we touch them. And as you're doing your uh, annual legal review, uh, it's, an, it's a good idea to uh, uh, increase your sophistication over time. Um, and coincidentally, that also helps uh, increase the value of your business. I know, uh, you know, some of us are uh, solos that, uh, um, you know, or, or there's maybe not a lot of value in our business other than ourselves. Um, but others of us are kind of building a machine and an organization that really has value separate from ourselves that we can sell at some, at some point. And the more that you increase your sophistication, that's one of the drivers of, of value uh, with businesses. If you've got a business that has no policies and procedures in place, um, it's gonna wor be worth a lot less than the exact same business that has uh, uh, increased its sophistication. So one, one thing to think about um, is uh, whether you should consider making uh, an election to be taxed as an S corporation and whether you're a C corporation or you're an LLC or a sole proprietor, um, it's uh, possible that you can save on taxes uh, by being electing to be taxed as an S corporation. And uh, again, this is a, an article that, uh, that I wrote that, it goes into more detail. I don't have time to, to really explain that much, but it, for a lot of people, it, it is, um, uh, would be advantageous. Um, but you also, I run into in my um, mergers and acquisitions business, uh, very often I run into uh, an instance where a seller, a company that's trying to sell itself is taxed as a C corporation. And it's really, they get hit hard with taxes when they sell their business. Um, now, if they had, uh, generally speaking, if several years earlier they'd made an election to be taxed as an S corporation, uh, they could save just a tremendous amount of money on taxes when they sell their business. Um, one of the reasons that you need uh, uh, time uh, ahead of time, uh, you need to do this with plenty of uh, time to spare before you sell your business, is this concept of S corporation built-in gains tax. And if you, uh, basically, if you sell your business uh, through a, an asset sale uh, within a certain amount of time after you make an election to be Texas and S, S corporation, you could get hit with uh, some extra taxes. So, but if enough time has passed, then those taxes aren't gonna be a problem. 